Go ahead and take out your copy of God's Word, Exodus chapter 20, verse 25 today. This is, this is a uh, unique altar. I don't know if you've heard about this altar that I'm going to preach about, and it's going to seem kind of strange, but, but I think it's going to be really interesting as we're in our altered series. Remember, our theme scripture in Leviticus says that the fire on the altar, fire on the altar must not go out, and that, that's God's plan that's his purpose is that the fire that he ignites you know if the fire goes out it's not God's fault God says I'm lighting the fire and he wants us to continue to to tend that fire to burn in that fire and so we've been preaching through altars we learned from Daniel chapter 6 that we need to build the altar of prayer that when we pray as usual it brings God's unusual we learned from first kings chapter 8 and obed edom that amazing blessings come to those that host the presence of the Lord, and that there's a difference between God's omnipresence and his manifest presence. There's a difference between just being open to experiencing God's presence and then being intentional about saying, God, I want your presence in my heart and in my home. We learn from Joshua chapter 4 that we want an altar of generations. It takes all the generations to get all the promises. Last week uh, from 1 Kings 18 and Elijah, the altar of God's power that we not only want to live lives that carry the fire I want to live a life that attracts the fire that attracts the right fire amen can you say amen we want to attract the fire of Elijah and today out of Exodus chapter 20 we're going to look at an altar that Moses builds and it's the altar of uncut stones so in this in this passage this phrase is not original in the in the Hebrew of your Bible the editors added it later just as kind of a challenge chapter heading, but I, but I love it because I think it's really appropriate. It's just kind of a heading for what we're going to read. And it simply says this, the proper use of altars. So remember that God's people are coming out of Egypt and God is teaching his people, this is what it means to carry the fire. This is what it means to be the people of God. And a key component of living in the fullness of what God has for us is altars. And so God says, if you want to carry the fire, you got to learn how to build the altar. So this is the proper use of an altar because an altar can be misused. And I'm going to show you how the enemy has hijacked altars in our society. And I'm going to show you from the word of God how some of what we're experiencing as a culture is the hijacking of altars. But Exodus 20:25, 20, And the Lord said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, you saw for yourselves, say for yourselves, you saw for yourselves that I spoke to you from heaven. I think sometimes we have a misunderstanding that under the old covenant in the Old Testament that God used Moses as an intermediary, as a, as a go-between between heaven and earth. That was never God's plan. God's plan was Moses says, I would that you would all prophesy. Sweet 15 was packed. I don't know if, if more people come, we're going to have to find more chairs with our school of the spirit because this is God's plan that everybody operates in the supernatural, that everybody releases the prophetic gift that is within them. The prophetic is not just for super spiritual people on Sundays. It's for ordinary people on ordinary days. And if the prophetic remains at the altar, God help us all. The prophetic is for the gates. It's for the gates. The prophetic is for the gates of education and the gates of business and the gates of government. And I believe that God is raising up a prophetic company at Multiply Concord in Cabarrus County that will take the fires of the altar to the gates. And we are going to see a mighty revival at the gates of our society. If you believe that, say amen. amen. He says, remember then, he says this, remember... You can't make any idols of silver or gold to rival me. And this is a little bit of a strange statement because Israel had never done that. So why would God tell them not to make an idol of silver or gold? We'll find, we'll find that out. It happens later on. God says, build my altar whenever I cause my name to be remembered and I will come and bless you. 
If you use stones to build my altar, use only natural, uncut stones. And do not shape the stones with a tool, for that would make the altar unfit for holy use. Again, remember that the Israelites had just come out of Egypt. They had been delivered from Egypt. But for 400 years, they had been immersed in Egyptian culture. Egyptian customs, Egyptian language, Egyptian mindsets, Egyptian ways of worship, Egyptian ways of doing education. And so what God was saying to Moses is, yes, I delivered you out of Egypt, but now I got to get the Egypt out of you. And how many of you understand that's what God does to us? When we say yes to Jesus, we are out of Egypt. Through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, you're not like half saved. You're not partially saved. You are delivered fully from Egypt. But how many of you know that the moment you say yes to Jesus, you still got some Egypt in you? You got some Egyptian thoughts. What did, what did Pharaoh do when the Israelites left? He, he did what? He chased, he chased them. How many of you know that as you chase after Jesus, sometimes those Egyptian thoughts are chasing after you? That, that old man, those old habits, they're chasing you down. And so what God says is you have to come to an altar so I can get rid of all that Egypt junk, all of those Egypt thoughts, all of those Egyptian habits, all of those old ways and I got to get that out of you. So, in the, so the way that God says that he's going to form his people, are, it actually happens to be on two pieces of rock. The first rock are the tablets, and then the second rock is the rock of the altar. So there's the, al- the, there's the rock that he gives the, Moses the Ten Commandments, or gives the Israelites the Ten Commandments, the tablets and the altar, the tablets and the altar. And can I submit to you for God to fully do what he wants to do in your life? We need the tablets and the altar. We need the word and encounter. You, you hear me? If you just have, first of all, let's talk about the tablets. We need, we need laws. We need rules. Oh, I can never, pastor, I can never serve God. Those 10 commandments, he's so mean. He just doesn't want me to have any fun. And it's just all these rules. And well, you know, how many of you know there are rules in other things of life as well? Like if we all went walking through, if we took a tour, Multiply Church, 930 service, we're going to take a tour right after this service of a nuclear power plant. Before they took us on a tour, they'd probably lay out some, some rules. And I would be concerned that not only I follow the rules, but I'm going to be concerned that y'all follow the rules as well. Because if you don't follow the rules, you are going to destroy yourself and everybody around you. All those power plant people, they're so mean. They just don't want me to have any fun. No, they're called boundaries. They want you to live. (laughs) The rules that God has given us for in our lives as a community, it's not because he's mad at us. It's because he wants you to live. He wants you to thrive. He wants our communities to thrive. Come on, how many of you can thank God for his rules? Thank God for his boundaries. They're a, ble- they're a blessing. But if we just have rules without relationship, I've been in both of these churches, y'all. I've been in both of those services. They had the word down. They read the word. They were going by the word. But I'm like, where's the, where's the, where's the fire? Like, where's the, where's the fire? But I've been in services where, like, there was a lot of fire. But I'm like... That's more wildfire than, well, like what kind of fire? There's strange, church, there's fire and there's strange fire. And we need the word of God and the discernment of God to be able to tell the difference because sometimes strange fire looks like real fire. We want the real fire. We're going to chase after the real fire of God, but we're not going to put up with the strange fire. We are going to make sure that every experience, that every encounter, that every prophecy, that every spiritual gift lines up with this, lines up with the written word of God. We need the tablets and we need the altar. So then, so then let's get back. This is still all my introduction. I'm not even close to preaching yet. 
I'm going to go back to our text just to remind me, and then I'm going to go into more introduction, and I still won't be into the message, but I'm just reminding myself. I'm just talking to myself. Verse 23, remember, don't make any idols of silver or gold to rival me. If you use stones to build my altar, use only natural uncut stones. All right, so, so let's get back to the silver or gold. Again, they hadn't done this, so, so why is God telling them this? Remember, God operates outside of time. God can see the future, and so unfortunately, he's seeing into the future. And so the reason that he says this in Exodus 20 is that God knows what is going to happen in Exodus 32. But before we get to Exodus 32, let me, let me catch up to speed or it's not going to make sense. So let me give you the context of the story. In Exodus 30, 22 through 33, there's the instructions for the anointing oil, which is to be set apart for the use unto the Lord. In Exodus 30, 34 through 38, there's the instructions for the incense. The incense is placed right in front of the Ark of the Covenant. Incense represents prayer, and the Ark is God's presence. It's prayer that brings us into the presence, and it's prayer that accesses the anointing in your life. Anointing always flows out of a place of prayer that connects you to God's presence and his holiness. And then in Exodus 31, we meet two people, Bezalel and Aholiab. Bezalel and Aholiab, and it's important that you know who these people are. So Exodus 31, then the Lord said to Moses, look, I've specifically chosen Bezalel of the tribe of Judah, and I have filled him with the Spirit of God. Now this is interesting because it's the first time other than the breath of God, the Ruach of God being breathed into Adam and Eve, this is the first time in Scripture that we read of somebody being filled with an infilling of the Holy Spirit. Prior to that, we read about the Spirit coming upon people to do certain tasks, but this is the first time that we read of the infilling of the Spirit. So if this is the first time, then we've got to say, okay, this is important. Why did this happen? to give him great wisdom, ability, and expertise in all kinds of crafts, the arts. He is a master artist. He is a master craftsman, an expert in working with gold, silver, and bronze. He's skilled at engraving and mounting gemstones and carving wood. He's a master at the arts. Those two words I'm just using interchangeably there. Verse 6, what about a holy app? And I have personally appointed a holy ab to be his assistant. Moreover, I have given him special skill to be gifted craftsmen or gifted artists so that, so the infilling of the Holy Spirit, first time we read about it, it's for the purpose of artists, fills artists. So why? Then what, what is the purpose of the, what is the purpose of the arts? If we don't understand the purpose of the arts, well, I'll, I'll get to that. So that they can make all the things that I have commanded you to make. The tabernacle, the Ark of the Covenant. What are those? The housing, the dwelling place under the Old Covenant of the presence of God. The Ark's cover, the place of atonement where people get right with Jesus. The furnishings of the tabernacle. The lampstand and all the accessories, the incense prayer, the altar, the burnt offerings with all its utensils, the beautifully stitched garments, the anointing oil. So watch this. The purpose, the, if we don't understand this, we're not going to understand what's going on in our society. The purpose of the arts is to lead people into the manifest presence of God. Now watch, what, now watch what happens. Watch what happens when the arts get hijacked by the enemy. Now we're at verse, now we're at Exodus 32. When the people saw how long it was taking Moses to come back down the mountain, they gathered around Aaron. Come on, they said, make us some gods who can lead us. We don't know what happened to this fellow Moses who brought us here from the land of Egypt. So Aaron said, take all the gold, and all the people took the gold and brought it to Aaron. Verse 4, then Aaron took the gold, melted it down, molded it into the shape of a calf. And when the people saw it, they exclaimed, O Israel, these are the gods who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And the people got excited. You have excitement and emotion divorced from what? The word, the word of God. 
And it's all based on feeling. Now, now watch what happens. Aaron saw how excited the people were, and he built an altar in front of the calf. And so the anointing of the arts gets hijacked because the anointing and the call of God are without repentance. And so arts, hear me, arts will lead you someplace spiritually. It depends on what arts you follow, where you are led spiritually. So these arts get hijacked and lead people's emotions away from the encounter of God into idol worship. So this, this is a, a, a couple of things we have to understand. That's why it is so important that we are aware of what's going on in our culture with the arts. You, you hear people, you know, every, every generation said this. Whether you remember it or not, you said it. Oh, mom, dad, it's, it's no big deal. It's just a song. You said, you said that. I'm, remi I'm reminding you. You said, it's no big deal. I just like the beat. I just like the music. I, I, oh, it's just, it's just a movie. It's no, it's no big de deal. It is a big deal. It's leading you somewhere spiritually. Because there is an inherent anointing on the music, on the filmmaking to lead. It's not just a... No, no, don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not going to get all legalistic. And, and you don't go home and tell... Well, the pastor said, I can't listen to anything but K-Love. And I just got to watch The Chosen over and over and over again. That's not what I'm saying. Birthday celebration today. Somebody breaks out and happy birthday. No, that's a secular song. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that you have to know the word of God and use discernment because arts are a powerful tool. And they will lead your spirit either into a place of joy, peace, love, goodness, gentleness, kindness, or they will lead you into idolatry. We become like that which we worship and arts are a form of worship. Does that make sense? So the second application of this is that's why we need blood-bought, spirit-empowered artists to rise up. And we need writers, photographers, musicians, singers, choreographers, dancers, poets, novelists, clothing designers, filmmakers who are filled with the Spirit of God with an anointing to lead a generation back to Jesus. And I want to preach this to the teenager that's here that has a gifting of the arts. God gave you that for the purpose of... I'm not saying that you, everything that you do has to be on Caleb, but there's an anointing on that to lead people back to the altar, to lead people back to the house of God. And we've got to understand the power of that anointing. That's still in my introduction. Now let me go to the text one more time and I'll really preach. Verse 23. Remember. Don't make any idols of silver or gold to rival me. Build an altar wherever I cause my name to be remembered. And I will come to you and bless you. If you use stones to build my, build my altar, use only natural uncut stones. Do not shape the stones with a tool, for that would make the altar unfit for holy use. In Genesis, God made us in his image, and then we try to return the favor and make him into ours. When you begin to shape the omnipotent holy God of the universe into your image, you build an idol. We become like that which we worship. The conversation between Susan and Mr. Beaver and C.S. Lewis's The Lion, which in the wardrobe goes like this. Aslan is a lion, the great lion. Oh, said Susan, I thought he was a man. Is he, is he quite safe? I should feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. Safe, said Mr. Beaver. Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. He's the king, I tell you. Following God, follow, if you're looking for a safe life, don't follow Jesus. He's not safe, but he's good. If you're looking to be in control of your life, if you're looking to shape your life according to everything that you don't want, then don't worship God because what we're actually doing is we're taking tools, we're taking tools to the altar. These are, these are five stone shaping tools that we have to lay down. God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come to you, but God, there's some, there's some things that just, well, they, it's acceptable now in our culture. 
and there's just that, there's that one verse, God, that I don't, I don't really like that one verse. Do you, see the, do you see the danger? When we pick up tools and when we, we begin to define the Bible, when we begin to define the teachings of Jesus according to what's acceptable in culture, if I was, if I was a, a, a stonemason, if I was a, a stonecutter and I was, I was building a wall and I, mar- I marvel at the ability of these stonemasons, how they, how they put all of these things together. But if I was to start to chisel away at this rock, what would be, what would be the purpose of me chiseling away at this rock? So that it could do what? Exactly. Fit in. God, help us if we begin to chisel away at the word of God just so that we can fit in. I got news for you, church. You won't. You won't. Jesus says that you'll be misunderstood. Jesus says you'll be hated. Jesus says that people won't understand you. And I hope it's not all the time, but it's going to happen. And so we've got to lay down these tools and say, God, if it's in your word, whether it's popular, whether it fits it, whether it helps us to fit into culture or not, we are going to lay down our tools of what's acceptable in our culture. The Second thing is that we got to be careful to lay down the tools of our opinions. And I don't like this one because I got a lot of them. I like to tell other people about them. I try to keep them away from Sunday morning, so I apologize to every other person in my life. But I spout off all my opinions all week. Just so, but I'm keeping them. They're guarding you. They, they're guarding you. They're keeping them out of the pulpit. But our opinions... People will, this is nothing, nothing wrong with this. These, these are fun, but you see these on, on social media. They'll give an opinion and then they'll finish. Have you seen this? They'll finish with the statement like, change, change my mind, right? Like, Smoke Pit has the best barbecue. Change my mind. This is the best television show. Change my mind. And then it's the, it's the discussion. That's, and that's fine for, that's fun on social media. But when we come to the holy word of God, it's got to be this. God, I got Egypt in me. Change my mind. I got, I got opinions, but change my mind. I want all of my thoughts. I want all of my opinions to line up with the word of God. We got to lay down our opinions. We got to lay down our comfort level. Spiritual comfort is bad enough, but we can turn comfort zone, we can turn our comfort zone into an idol, and we can begin to think that the purpose of our Christian existence is to live a safe, comfortable life, and let me just, let me just chisel that area off because it doesn't fit into my box that I've constructed out of all of these things, and God, I got to get you into my box where you're safe, I got to get you into my box, and this, and this feeds into number four, our experience, because we all have, and, and again, there's nothing wrong, there's nothing wrong with experience. I, thank, I don't know about you, I thank God for my, my altar experiences. I'm, I found Jesus at an altar in Emlington, Pennsylvania at Chapel on the Hill, Assembly of God. I got baptized in the Holy Spirit with evidence of speaking in tongues at an altar in Santo Domingo in the Dominican Republic in August of 1992 on the hottest day ever on planet Earth as I was sweating through like those altar experiences. I got called into ministry in Erie, Pennsylvania on a January when I ran from the second row at First Assembly. I ran to the front begging God just just use me. And so I'm thankful for those altars. I'm th- thankful for the songs that were sung. But how many of you know, if we're not careful, we will try to read our experience of how God reached us on how God is going to reach somebody else. God, help us stop trying to shape other people's encounter with God in a way that makes me feel safe and comfortable. When I read through scripture, people did some pretty radical things and encountered God in some pretty radical ways. When it's your friend that's paralyzed, you cut a hole in the roof. Not in our roof, Pastor Bill. We're spending a lot of money on that roof. (laughs) If you bring somebody to service in the door, just knock. We'll open the doors. (laughs) We'll get the doors open. When doctors tell you there's nothing more that they can do, you push through the crowd. 
When it's your daughter that needs healed, you break protocol. When it's your sin that didn't deserve to be forgiven, you break a jar of perfume over Jesus' feet. So God, I repent for judging somebody else's exuberance in worship because I don't know what God brought them out of. And I never want to have a pharisaical spirit. How dare you break that perfume when they are worshiping Jesus with everything that they got. God, may we never define what you want to do in a generation and confine that to the past experience of how I encountered you. You know, there's three ways to attend a restaurant, to go to a restaurant. You can go as a food critic, you can go as a picky eater, or you can go hungry. There's three ways to attend church. You can come as a food critic, you can come as a picky eater, or you can come hungry. I want to come hungry, church. How many of you want to be hungry? God, whatever's on the menu this morning, whatever you're serving up, whatever the bread of life has for me today, if the preacher is off that morning, morning I'm still gonna get some word because I'm coming hungry I'm ready to eat I'm ready to feast on the word of God the final thing that the tools that somebody somebody you got you're holding these tools tight today and you love God you want to serve him you want to give everything to him but the tools that you are holding on to are the tools of your past And you say, I know what God says, but I don't believe that he could really love me because of what I've done. I don't know. I know that God can forgive other people, but I don't know if he can really forgive me. I know that God can use other people, but I don't know if God can really use me. No, lay that down. See, here's what I see happening. You're not, you're today, you're going to lay those tools down and you're going to stop shaping God in your image and you're going to take on a new shape. You're going to take on a new shape. You know what your new shape is? I see your new shape. It's the shape of the cross. It's the shape of Jesus over your life. It's the shape of the shed blood of Jesus Christ over over every sin, every inadequacy, every fear, every failure, failure, that's your new shape. That's your new shape. You don't get to shape the cross. The cross shapes you. This, this rock, this rock, this is actually her son. You've seen this rock. This, this is our workout rock. We started doing rock workouts. I don't know why. <laughs> and now I got a kid. Me. Come here, Adam. <laughs> Come here. <laughs> don't pretend. Don't pretend. Don't get that guitar out of your hands. See what we do. What we do is we do this. We do this workout. It's called a. It's called a HIT workout. Y'all know what a HIT workout is? H-I-I-T, high intensity interval training. Some people call it Tabata, Dr. Tabata, uh, speed skating, um, form the j- Japanese. Now put, put, put it down, I'm gonna have you. So like for 30 seconds, we'll do, we'll do burpees for 30 seconds. A burpee, to, a burpee to row. We'll just do one then, just do one. Do, so do burpee to row. I'm all, I'm all mic'd up. I got wires all, o- all over me. I got, well, no, with, the, yeah, but with the rock. Put, put your hands on the rock, on the side, like, the, I got you. I, uh, like this. Like, so the burpee, and then up into the, up into the row. So do, do that, do that. All right, so burpee to row. So you're doing, so you're doing 30 seconds of that and then a 10 second rest. And then you gotta do 30 second press. So show them how to do that good form shoulder press with you, you know, sucked in all nice and tight. All right, that's good, that's good. 30 seconds of that and then 10 seconds of rest. And then curls, 30 seconds of curls. You're doing 30 seconds of curls, all right? And then a 10 second rest. And then you can do 30 second squat. So up, on, up to your chest. Now, don't do none of this. That's not a squat. That ain't a squat. I could call, I could call some people out, but I'm going to be nice. I'm going to be, come on. That's a, that's a squat right there. And then, some, and then we're going to finish with tri extensions. So 30 seconds of tri extensions. And then, and then so what you do, and then you can put it, you can put it down. Y'all give Adam a hand. Yeah, yeah. 
it's styrofoam. <laughs> but you do that, you do that for three rounds and then you get a break and then like you run a mile and then you go and you do that again for another three rounds. Here's what, here's what I know. So this was a, is that, is that picture on there? Throw that picture on there. So this was Thursday and so it was all muddy and sloppy and everything like that. And I was covered in mud and I was wet. And then I had to pick up uh, one of my kids from school. I went walking into school. I didn't have a change of clothes. So I'm covered in, covered in mud. But here's, here's, what I, here's what I know. Here's what I know. If you're doing it right, you don't, you don't shape this rock. <laughs> you're preaching good. <laughs> you say... You say, well, pastor, you don't look like that rock's been shaping you. Can I just tell you, there are, there are other forces at work as well. <laughs> and the force of two pieces of cheesecake on Friday night, that's, that's a force that is at work from the inside working out. But you, you don't get to shape this. This shapes you. And aren't you glad? Aren't you glad that you can build your house on the sand? What, what is sand? It's chiseled rock, isn't it? So, so you can build your house according to your own construct, your own opinions, your own experiences, your own likes, your own dislikes. You can build that house. But the Bible says that storms will come. And if you build your life on your opinions, then it all falls apart. But if you build your life on the solid, uncut rock, God, I don't like that. And God said, I'll say, to, I'll tell God that. God, I don't like that. God tells me I didn't ask you. <laughs> all right, God, uncut, uncut, shape me. But if you build your life on this, then when the storms come, and they will, you will not fall. I don't know what storms are coming against you. I don't know what thoughts are coming against you. I don't know what emotions are coming against you. I don't know what financial storm is coming against you. I don't know what job storm is coming against you. But can I speak over you that your life is built on the solid rock of Jesus Christ. And when those storms come, when those storms come, you're going to remain steadfast. Father, I pray in this place for everybody that a, that a storm is rolling over their marriage right now. And I speak to you, cling to Jesus. I pray for everybody that a storm is rolling over your emotions right now and I speak to you cling to Jesus pray for everybody that a storm is rolling over how many of you how many of you would say pastor that's me I got a storm in my life and I don't want to cling to the sand I want to cling to the rock would you just lift a hand and say pastor that's me I want to cling to the rock I want to hold on to the rock I want the rock to, I want the rock to shape me I see the rock shaping you in the midst of your storm I know it's tough but the rock is shaping you the rock is molding you because God sees more in you than you see in in yourself and he's shaping you and he's forming you your new shape is the cross your new shape is the mercy of the cross your new shape is the grace of the cross you are built to carry to carry the grace that is upon your life with heads still bowed and eyes still closed how many would say this pastor if I'm being honest I built my life on the sand I'm not serving Jesus I'm serving myself, I'm serving my, my wants, my opinions, my likes, my whatever, whatever it is. But pastor, my life is not being built on Jesus and I need to give my life to Jesus. With heads bowed, eyes closed, I'm gonna count to three. If that's you, I want you to raise your hand. We're gonna pray for you and you're going to go from death to life right now, right where you're at. One, two, three. Pastor, I need Jesus. I need Jesus. I want to move from the sand to the rock. I need Jesus. I need Jesus. Just slip your hand up. You can slip it back down. Can we all pray together? I got you. Anybody online? Anybody online? Anybody else in the house that would join 
Pastor, I need Jesus. I don't want to build on the sand anymore. I don't want to build on the sand. I want the rock. I want the rock. I want the rock. Church family, let's surround those that have lifted their hand and pray together. Come on, let's all pray out loud. Let's say his name. Jesus, forgive me of my sin. I come to the cross. I ask forgiveness. I ask you to come into my heart. Come into my life and help me to live wide awake to the love of God and fully alive to my purpose. And it's in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Come on, can we celebrate with those who went from death to life today? Well, I hope the service today made a difference in your life. And if you made a decision to follow Jesus today, we would love to know. All you have to do is text ALIVE to 94000. We have some resources we'd love to give you as you begin your journey following Him. Well, it's February. It's February. What a great month. It's a month. Mm -hmm. You made it past the first month and you're into the second month. Yeah. Now we get to like eat pizza and watch football. That's right. All your New Year's resolutions you've already met. You don't have to make any more. Throw them out the window. Throw it's football time. Just go ahead. Except for praying. Make sure you keep praying. Don't oh, stop. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Don't, don't stop. stop. Never stop. But, so, but Valentine's Day, you eat some more chocolate. You gotta have chocolate. Pizza and for football. Super <laughs> Sunday's coming up. I mean, like, it's I mean, eating I mean, time. I mean, can't say <laughs> Sorry. Oh, you um, can't? So, no, it's copyrighted. Oh, just beep it out when you yeah. do the little editing. Yeah. You're going to make this so hard. Sorry. It's all right. Well, hopefully you have a great big game plan to come up in the future. In the bowl. That is super. Yes. That was good. Yeah, that works. <laughs> See you next week.